His Excellency Shri J. D. Patnaik, Governor of Assam, Honorable Chief Minister Sri Tarun Gogoi, Honorable Sri Gautam Bora, Minister of Education, Government of Assam, Honorable Professor Sri Nath Barua, Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, faculty members, students, ladies and gentlemen. I feel greatly honored to have been invited to deliver the Foundation Day Lecture in the Krishnakanta Handikoi State Open University of Assam, the first open university in the entire northeastern region of our country. I am grateful to the organizers, especially Professor Srinath Barua, Vice Chancellor, and his uh, colleagues in the Board of Management for giving me this opportunity to be amongst you on this very joyful occasion. I am happy to note that July 20th, the birthday of late Professor Krishnakanta Handikoi, has been declared as the foundation day of this renowned university. An illustrious son of Assam, Professor Krishna Handikoi, was one of the greatest Sanskritist and Indologist, and above all, an educationist with uncommon ability and vision. He was proficient in several languages such as Sanskrit, Latin, Greek, French, German, Russian, Italian, and Spanish. His pioneering work on Western literature and criticism in Assamese acquainted the readers with various aspects of Spanish, Greek, Russian, and German literature. His illustrious literary contributions include translation uh, of Sanskrit Mahakavya, uh, Naisa Chakarita in English, Yasakstika and Indian culture, Pravara Sainaz Setubandha, among others. To commemorate the enormous contributions of this great scholar in the field of education, literature, and Indology, a postal stamp was issued in his honor in the year 1983. Indeed, the foundation lecture, this foundation lecture is uh, a great opportunity for all of us to remember Professor Handikoi's contribution and to learn some lessons from his life and mission. This university, which carries the name of this great scholar, has done exceedingly well since its uh, inception and commencement in 2006. I've been told that there are close to 30,000 students who are enrolled in various programs offered by the university and 195 study centers across the state which are engaged in running the programs. I am happy to note that this open university has been running a bachelor preparatory program BPP for the non 10 plus 2 learners in the region since January 2008 which has been a great success. The university is offering five different bachelor's degree programs at present, Bachelor of Arts, Commerce, Business Administration, Mass Communication and Computer Application. The university, as, as it was reported by the Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, is going to start from this year a master's degree program in respect of management in computer science, mass communication and social work along with other social sciences and humanities. The university has also launched a PhD program along with other research-oriented courses in collaboration with the academic staff of the Assam Agricultural University, Johar. Moreover, the university is contemplating various certificate and diploma courses, diploma programs on animal husbandry and home science. I am particularly delighted to note that this university for the first time has introduced vocational training, uh, vocational programs completely free of cost with the help of four polytechnics and ten ITIs of Assam. The university's mandate of offering free education to jail inmates uh, has been further extended by opening a study center at the Johar Central Jail. Interestingly, the university has started a radio station now and has become the first organization in the entire northeastern region that broadcasts programs through community radio service. I wish to place on record my appreciation for the excellent job that this university has been doing. Education with, without barriers was, uh, I'm told, uh, and I saw it in the film, that is the motto of this university, and true to this motto, this university has been doing very well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, every university is envisaged as an instrument of socio-economic development and empowerment. Moreover, every university is expected to promote interests 
in the life, literature, languages and cultures of the people. And I believe that this university has been successfully played an exceedingly important role of bulwarking demographic uh, process by way of imparting quality education to the masses and strengthening cultural integration. On this occasion, therefore, I would like to share some thoughts with you before this August gathering on the new and emerging horizons uh, in the higher education sector in our country today. Let me start by emphasizing the importance of education. The Honorable Chief Minister talked about how education is important and how it is uh, going to be very important for the future growth and economic development. To my mind, education plays a vital role in the economic growth and development of any nation. It is increasingly big, being recognized the world over that countries that have greater capacity to absorb and generate new knowledge and skilled human power are likely to have a comparative age over others in others who do not, particularly in attaining and sustaining high economic growth over the countries that do not. The underlying logic behind that is straightforward. What education does is essentially to improve the functional and analytical capabilities of individuals. This opens up opportunities for individuals as well as social groups to achieve greater access to employment opportunities and professional fulfillment. Moreover, education is not only an instrument for enhancing operating efficiency, but it also forms the backbone of socio-economic transformation. Uh, it is an effective tool for widening and augmenting demographic participation and upgrading the overall quality of individual and societal life. To my mind, ladies and gentlemen, the importance of education sector in India today is more than ever before. For at least two reasons. First, the fortuitous occurrence of demographic dividend. And second, even more fortuitous, fortuitous is the timing of its occurrence. The present decline in the dependency ratio in India from 0.8 in 1991 to 0.73 in 2001 and further down to 0.59 in 2011 estimated has meant that India, our country, is having the world's youngest labor force with the median age in 2020 projected at only 29 as compared to 37 in China and United States 45 in Western Europe and 48 in Japan. Which means that while elsewhere in the world, in China as well as in the industrial countries, dependency ratios are rising and the young population shrinking, India, our country is blessed with the population of which about 70% uh, below are in the age of 25 years. Uh, in fact, in India, the population in the age group of 10 to 19 years, uh, in the year 2006-2007, the population in India in the age group of 10 to 19 was 225 million. Today, it is roughly estimated at 240 million. Please note that it happens to be the largest ever cohort of young people moving on, making a transition to the adulthood in the history of mankind. So never before such a large mass of society, young people, 10 to 19, were moving towards adolescence at any point in, 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 the, in the history of mankind. In other words, India has a unique opportunity to potentially complement what the aging rest of the world needs most. Elsewhere in the world, people, you know, the proportion of old people is growing, whereas in India we have a proportion of young people uh, rising. This demographic dividend becoming available to India is coinciding, as the Honorable Chief Minister mentioned, is coinciding with the phase of exceptionally high economic growth. Before the global crisis hit the world and to India in September 2008, we had posted a growth rate of 9% per year for three years in a row. On an average it was 9% plus and that marked India as the second fastest growing country in the world. Needless to say that this tremendous human resource potential uh, would have to be converted 
into reality and in this process it is the education and skill development sector that holds the critical key. In other words, India's transition towards emergence as a global reservoir of skilled person power and the resultant status as an economic powerhouse critically depends upon our ability to leverage the demographic dividend. This would in turn be contingent on making higher education and skill development sector robust, forward-looking and vibrant. Indeed, I dare say that if we do not reform our higher education sector, if we do not reform our skill development sector and harness this fortuitous demographic dividend, there is a non-trivial risk of our country actually facing a demographic nightmare. So this is a great opportunity for us. We need to, we must put our efforts together and make concerted efforts to reap the benefits of demographic dividend. If we don't do that in time, the demographic dividend is likely to become a demographic disaster or a demographic nightmare. Uh, I was very happy to learn when the Honorable Chief Minister mentioned that, uh, that uh, he is contemplating, the government of Assam is contemplating opening a skill development center in every block. Uh, let me tell you the background. At the central government level, Honorable Prime Minister has launched a skill development mission uh, which has the objective of making 500 million young people in our country fully trained by the year 2022. That is the target. That is the way we are going to harness the demographic dividend. In October 2008, Honorable Prime Minister wrote a personal letter to all the chief ministers of all the states in our country requesting them that like the central government is creating a skill development mission at the central government level, there should be a state level skill development missions as well. Uh, and I'm, among other things, I'm looking after that too. Few months back, I had a press con I had a video conference of all the states and we discovered that half the states have not even made a beginning. So we are way behind and we need to catch up and we have to put our act together. It is keeping in that mind, keeping that in mind, uh, last month uh, the Honorable Deputy Chairman of Planning Commission wrote a letter to uh, the Honorable Chief Minister that uh, we are going to organize, the Planning Commission is going to organize five regional conferences all over the, all over the country. And in those regional conferences, of course, for the Northeastern region, I have chosen Guwahati as the place to be. So uh, we are waiting for the response from the Honorable Chief Minister. Uh, and next month sometime, we will have uh, a, a, a skill, skill development workshop where representatives of all states in the Northeastern region are expected to participate. And I believe that would give a lot of push to skill, de skill development exercise in Assam and elsewhere in the Northeastern region. That is why when the Honorable Chief Minister was talking about opening a skill development center in every block, it was the music to my ears and I'm sure with uh, the leadership of uh, this Ch Honorable Chief Minister, this goal can be achieved in sooner, sooner rather than later. Let me go back to the main theme of my scheme. Uh, I want to talk about the education sector, the higher education sector, where it stands and where it is going. Because there are metamorphic changes taking place in the education sector. Let me begin by dimensions of the higher education sector today. Without doubt, the spatial expansion of network of higher education sector in India has been very impressive. At the time of independence in 1947, there were only 20 universities, around 500 colleges and about 2.4 lakh students. Over the years, the Indian higher education system has grown into one of the largest one in the world, next only to United States and China. According to the latest available data, the higher education sector today comprises 504 universities, nearly 26,000 colleges, and the student enrollment of more than 1.5 crore, 150 lakh, and faculty strength of about 5.22 lakh. Contrary to general belief, what constitutes the bulk of Indian higher education 
sector is the state universities. Presently, there are 243 state universities and most of them have a large number of affiliating colleges and uh, typically with very large student population. I might add that in the Pune University where I was the Vice Chancellor until last year, uh, happens to be the largest traditional university in the world with 650,000 students. Uh, so the state universities can be very big and they are very big in many places. In addition to the state university, there are 40 central universities, 130 deemed to be universities, 53 state private universities, and 33 institutions of national importance established under central legislation, and five institutions established under the state legislation, which together cater to perhaps no more than 15% of the aggregate student enrollment. In technical sector, that is uh, include that includes management institutes, by end of August 2008. Our country had 8,568 state-funded institutions which comprised 20, nearly 2,400 engineering colleges, nearly 1,700 polytechnics, nearly 1,600 institutes of pharmacy, 172 institutes of hotel management, 106 institutes for architecture, and 14 institutes of art and craft. In, a, in addition, there were about 1,500 plus management institutes for MBA as well as postgraduate diploma and 1,137 postgraduate institutes for computer application. Uh, of the 8,588 uh, technical institute, 6,244. I will circulate this speech, so I don't want to give you too many numbers, but this is this looks very big. Now, the 11th five-year plan which is currently ongoing, has placed a great emphasis on expanding access to education at all levels. As far as the higher education is concerned, the 11th five-year plan envisaged large expansion by setting up 1,465 new institutions, including 30 central universities, of which 14 have already become operational, 8 new IITs, of which 6 have already become operational, eight new IIMs of which four have been approved uh, in the year 9, 2009 and 10, 10 National Institutes of Technology, NITs, five Indian Institute of Information Technologies, IIITs, five Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, ICELS, two schools of planning and architecture, 374 model degree colleges in backward districts and 1,000 polytechnics of which 300 would be in public sector for educational backward districts, another 300 in PPP mode, public, uh, uh, public private uh, participatory kind of mode, uh, and remaining 400 at the private ones. Now this enormous physical expansion, you know, it looks very impressive, and this had prompted earlier, until recently, it had prompted many, many analysts to say that uh, we have the third largest trained person power in the world. No more people are talking about it. Why? Because it is increasing, increasingly being recognized that the adequacy and relevance of higher education system is questionable. And I say this with responsibility. Of late, more pertinent questions are asked. Importantly, it is being asked, is the enlarged higher education sector really consistent with the national aspirations such as achieving and maintaining high growth rate trajectory. We are talking about achieving a double digit growth. So what was, what looked impressive and big enough when we had 3.5% growth, would that be enough when our growth rate accelerates from 9% uh, which was there for, for 3 years in a row until 07, 08, when we move into double digit uh, trajectory. We can certainly, you know, we have gained the momentum at the national level and this will drive us to achieve 10% growth rate in the next 4 or 5 years. The question is, is our education system consistent, they, even after enlargement, is it consistent with maintenance of that high rate of growth? This is questionable, don't take anything for granted. In the similar vein, it is being asked whether the enlarged higher education sector is capable of delivering outcomes that would facilitate transformation of India, as the Honorable Chief Minister was saying, uh, as a major knowledge economy. These questions are very important questions, and I want to address these questions, and these questions can be addressed only uh, by a detailed analysis of access, 
quality, affordability and employability of higher education system in India today. Let's start with access. You know, we think that we have big system, but the access is very, very limited. Uh, how do we measure the access? The access is typically measured in terms of what is called gross enrollment ratio. Gross enrollment ratio would tell you in the age group of 18 to 23, that is supposed to be the age group for higher education. What proportion of our population in the age group of 18 to 23 have access to higher education? We are talking about sheer access. Quality comes later. The gross enrollment ratio in India, the last, the latest number that is available is only 2006-2007. It was only 12.4. And the target for the 11th five-year plan is about 15%. So 15%, how large is 15%? Even if the target is achieved, right now it is about 12.4%. 12.4% is only one half of the gross enrollment ratio average for the world. 12.4% is only two thirds of the average for all the developing countries. China's example, China's example is I think eye opener. Uh, because we have, we have the gross enrollment ratio which is only half of the world's average and only two thirds of the average for the developing countries. And if you look, compare with the developed countries, developed country average of GER is 58% and we are stuck at 12.4%. Comparison with China is quite revealing. Until the year 1999, GER in higher education in India and China was broadly comparable, 6%. From 6% in 1999, we have moved to 12.4% in 2006 2007. In the meantime, China has moved from 6% to 22%. That means again, comes back, coming back to what the Honorable Chief Minister was saying, we really have a long way to go and there is no room for complacency. Even this 12.4% of GR, which is low by international comparison, if you break it down into various social, social groups, what picture do you get? If you break it down between scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, OBCs, Muslims, if you break it down into male and female, if you break it down between rural and urban, if you break it down between poor and non-poor, what do we see? I'll give you some numbers which are which should be shocking every 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 thinking uh, Indian. If you look at um, you know uh, the, the GR for the GR, I don't want to give you all the numbers, but I just, just symbolic numbers I want to give. Uh, within the overall average GR of about, in, these are numbers which are old, 2004-2005, that time the GR, overall GR was 11%. When the overall GR was 11%, uh, for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe group, it was only 6.3%. For Muslims, it was 6.8%. For female Muslims, it was only 5.8% and for female scheduled caste and scheduled tribe group it was only 4.4 to 4.7 and if you go for a division further division between poor and non-poor for scheduled tribe women in the poor strata in the rural area can you imagine our GER has been less than 2% I think we have to hang our head in shame that after all these years, there is a large strata of society where the access to higher education is less than 2%, 98% of, 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 of uh, this society, this strata of society do not have any access to higher education. This is the sad reality and therefore I think we have to take that reality into, 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 uh, uh, into account. Then comes, this is the sheer access, let's talk about the quality. If you look at the quality, quality is a very serious problem with the existing system of higher education. There are three major issues uh, uh, which I want to flag for your, your, your attention. First, the curricula of several courses in most universities are seriously out of alignment. Secondly, this comfortingly large proportion of college teachers, unfortunately, are blissfully unaware of recent advances in their own subjects. Third, anecdotal evidence suggests that the research output of our universities has been growing very slowly and we are falling way behind. Until 1992, the research output of all Indian universities and the 
university in China was broadly comparable. Here, by research output, I mean articles, research papers published in refereed journals. I'm not talking about newspaper articles. If you compare them, in, until 1992, India and China were broadly similar. Today, China is producing five times more research papers, and we believe that we have a larger number of people who are proficient in English. 